It's not where we're going, but in Isaiah. <laughs> There's a verse that talks about, come, all who are thirsty, come by wine and meat, right? But at the beginning of that verse in Isaiah, there's an introduction to it that says, Ho! It, it means wake up, pay attention. So in my church, we've been talking about for a, a number of months now. Started maybe on Pentecost. Maybe it was before that. I don't remember when I started. It must have been Pentecost. So I make my church, and I'm going to ask you to do this because I need you to engage. How many of you know that if you're engaged, it's easier for the pastor and the worship leader to step into their place? Right? When we're just not engaged, yeah, Jim's over here. We, listen, look at your pastor. He's got both hands going, big smile on his face. Like, please, pastor, tell him. Right? Listen. So I want you to say with me, and I'll, and I'll give you a count. So you, but I want everyone to do it. So let's stand up together. Because we're used to watching others do. Like we watch Jesse pour out. Or you watch your pastor pour out. Or you might watch others do it. But we need to pour out. And we need to engage, not spectate. And so I want us to say, hey. But I don't want us to go, hey. Listen, when I was a kid, I'm dating it. Some of you guys that are younger may not remember this. But how many of you know what Happy Days was? Remember the TV show Happy Days? Remember what did Fonzie say? Hey. Right? That's how we do it. Hey. No, we're not going to do that. We're the people of God. We're going to declare. We're going to shout. And I want you to do it because what you're doing is you're releasing a sound. You're alerting the atmosphere. We're in place and we're engaged in the battle. So we're going to shout. Everyone say shout. shout. We're going to shout the word hey. Is that all right? And I'll do it first just so you see what it looks like and sounds like. So this is what it goes. Hey! Hey! So there we go. So let's go all together on the count of three. One. Two, three. Hey! hey! You got me convinced. All right, you can be seated. If you didn't do it, we were going to stay standing. <laughs> now listen, next Sunday when you come in here, you say to Jesse as he's up here waiting, because I saw him waiting today for us to begin, and he's just in there and he's in the zone, just go, hey, Jesse, hey! Let him know you're engaged. Pastor gets up from the chair and he steps into the pulpit. Hey! My church doesn't even wait for me anymore. They're just letting me know they're engaged. They're plugged in. They're ready to go. They're willing to receive. They're willing to pour out. God wants to do something in our day, and I don't want to be on the outside looking in. I want to be a part of what God wants to do. Hey, that's why I'm going to Lebanon, because I don't want to miss it. I know God's going to do something to significantly impact America. I'm not saying that we're the magic formula. I don't think that there's anything about what we're doing that's mystical. I believe the act of faith that causes us to journey to the heart of America, to pray to the heart of America. I've been praying, God, let that be the epicenter. And from there, the earth is going to quake. And there are going to be concentric circles that are going to rip all the way through the continent back to each coast and up to each border and down, up and down to each border. My wife's been praying in earnest, God, when we're there, would you let us feel it here? Amen. Would you agree with us in that? Amen. That there's going to be a release of something that changes everything. I'm so bold as to pray, God, let it not only be for America, but let this quake skip across oceans and, and go across border walls and find its way around the globe because this is all of God's creation and God is not a man that he would partial, you know, show partiality to anybody. God wants everybody to come unto repentance and to be saved. Amen? Amen. All right. So we're going to look at Daniel because I think Daniel is a man in season much like the season we're in. Is that all right? God highlighted this. Pastor had asked me to bring a rhema word. So what I'm saying to you today is I don't want just a logos. I don't just want a word. Listen, I said to my, my team this morning, the word is always good, amen? amen? The word is always good. Never is it not good. And never is it out of season. But sometimes the word comes alive in a way that God highlights that literally goes bang in your mind and engages you with a today word. Everyone say today. Today. Get used to playing with me. I'm different than your pastor. <laughs> We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look at 20 verses. Yeah, we'll, we'll get them in. I'm just trying to see if I have time, but I do. We're going to. God's good that way. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. Listen, this is what I want to talk to you about. 
what it takes to thrive spiritually. Everyone say thrive. Thrive. Oh, see, y- y'all ain't even doing it. All right. See how we lost the momentum even from hey? Thrive. Hey. hey. Right? So everyone say thrive. Thrive. All right. Listen, the world around you doesn't want a bunch of sourpuss Christians. There's enough sourpuss unbelievers out there. They need to see somebody that has life in them. And, and what we've got to do is start to believe God has life for us. It's time for us to rise up in the life. It's the enemy who steals, kills, and destroys. When you're walking around feeling like things have been stolen to you from you, that's not God. That's the enemy of your soul. Don't give the enemy ground to take things that God wants to deliver you to or deliver you from. He wants you to thrive, to move into the things of the kingdom. And Daniel lived in a day not unlike our own. He had a government in place that was ungodly, right? He had things that we're going to learn. I don't want to give you the whole message without giving you the message. I need to come back to the Word. Let's do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read. I'm not going to read all 20 verses and then teach it. That's how I would have been doing it in the Methodist church. I'm going to read a couple verses and part with the knowledge is and keep going that way. Is that all right? Everyone say, yes, Pastor. All right. Listen, even if it wasn't, that's what I was doing. I just want to make sure you're good. Just make sure you're engaged. Make sure you're plugged in. Because, listen, the things that Jesse's saying, brother man, can you stand up for a minute or are you busy back there? Listen, I just want to ask you a question. Did you pick the songs because you knew what we were doing or did the Spirit of God just lead those songs to you? Let me tell you what I heard in just even the first couple. I stopped writing because I'm like, I'm writing, out a, I'm writing out a note space here. Build your kingdom here. Man, everything we're doing in route for this journey was on that song. Like I, I, I could have written every, every verse from that song down. Brother, man, well done then in hearing the voice of the Spirit. And then, and then the second song was God of Revival. Man, if there's nothing that comes out of this, what I want to come out of this is revival. America needs revival. Revival happens when the people of God that are called by His name will call upon Him, will seek His face, turn from their wicked ways, when, when we will pray. Revival begins in the house of God. We want society to be changed. God's saying, I want you to be changed, church. It's time for you to stop judging the world. It's time for you to get right with me so that we can then see the fruit of revival. So God of revival was the second thing. And in one of the songs, Jesse, remind me, I don't know if it was God of revival or whatever, which song contained the expression binding and loosing or bind and loose? Was it God of revival? Build your church. Okay, build your church. Okay, so the, and then the next song, or whichever one it was, I, like I said, I'm just writing like, and I'm writing out a note space. And Man, we're, we're going about this nation with the desire to bind and loose. There are some things that need to be broken off. There are some things that need to be tightened up. There are some things that need to shift. There are some things. Listen, everything he said. So I can, I'm not going to go over all of it again. If you missed it, ask for the tape. <laughs> Jesse will give you the list, I'm sure. So that you can understand, this is what God is doing in our day. And we do not want to sit idly by and watch it happen. We want to be partakers of it and participants in it. And if we don't want to be partakers of it and participants in it, can I just ask you, what are you doing here? Like, in all honesty, what are you doing here? And And listen, I'm not trying to grow down this church, but if you're not really about it, then what are you doing? And if you're not about it, but you want to be about it, would you get serious about going after it? Please. Because society is going to bring the ruin. Listen, there's an enemy of our soul. And that enemy is only here to steal, kill, and destroy. And he'll take as many of us with him as he can. And so if we don't engage like Daniel did, let's look. Because I could have just literally taken the song lyrics that Jesse chose and said, yes, Lord. All right. In the third year of the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, you all heard of him, right? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. There's an enemy that's coming after you. He's coming in to steal, to take from you 
what is yours. He besieged Jerusalem in a two-year battle. That's what I read in my study notes. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried into the land of Shinar, the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. When we allow the world to influence us, even the things of God that we have will be taken from us and used for the ungodly purposes of another. Hear me in this. If we're not engaging properly, God will give us over to the hand of the enemy, and then even what we have of God will be taken from us and used in idolatrous worship. You don't think that the world right now has a, has a whole attack to take a formerly Judeo-Christian country and turn it around into things that we're just, we're not even being besieged. We're just giving it away. Right. We're not discerning. We're, we're like ignorant of what's going on around us. And what's happening in our ignorance is we're going, oh, Nebi, Nebi. I call him Nebi. Nebi, here's my stuff. Thank you for giving me everything from the government for free that's taken away my work ethic and that's making me value what you've given to me. God, I, Nebi, I'm just going to give it to you. Oh, you're going to use it in ungodly ways? Well, that's okay as long as it seemingly doesn't affect me. There's an enemy. And because we are not standing rightly as, as uh, Jehoiakim was it, we are being besieged. Hear me, church. It's infiltrated the church. I'm not even talking about our government offices. We're praying for them too. We're praying for the judicial system. We're making stops everywhere we can to broaden the appeal of Christ to our nation. But man, we're just turning stuff over. Free will. Please remember, just think about this for a moment. I, this is, and again, no matter what you think of the election results, please just hear me. We voted this way. When, when we vote this way, God gives us over to the desires of our heart. It might not be your desire, but it's our desire because this is where we are as America. And so what we see with the riots that we've seen, I'm amazed that most of the culture has remained silent and unappalled. And that somehow the media portrays these as just, just protests. Wait, burning down cities, defunding law enforcement, crazy stuff. But we've lost our mind. And so before I go further in Daniel, I want you to remember in Scripture, Saul lost his mind. God sent him a tormenting spirit. Remember that. God sent him a tormenting spirit because he lost his mind, as he lost his mind. In the New Testament, we can point all the way up to there because you can go past it. That's Old Covenant. Yep, it is. But remember, the prodigal is in the New Testament. Jesus tells the story. And he went off because he was out of his right mind. He went off in a far country. He was living outside of what his values were, wallowing with the pigs, Eating the leftovers, that's how bad it got. It wasn't even the stuff that the pigs ate, it was the leftovers that the pigs didn't eat. And it says when he came to his right mind, church, it's time to get back to your right mind. It's time to wake up. We can't just live in a far country and think everything's okay. Because even what we have of God will be taken from us. If we want to thrive spiritually, we've got to, be, we've got to guard what's been given to us. Our inheritance that we talked about with the land. We've got to guard it. We can't just sign it over. We can't just let it go. We've got to stand up and take account. We've got to be accountable. One day we're all going to stand before the Father. Yes. And I heard, I think it was pastor praying. We want to hear, well done, not away from me. The lukewarm church is spewed out of the mouth of Jesus. And let me tell you what he's talking about, because he's not talking about a building. He's talking about you and me. That's right. We are the church. We sang it. If 
I were to ask you at the beginning of my message, I know what you're, you're going to say now, but if I were to ask you at the beginning of my message, how many of you want to be spewed out of the mouth of Jesus? Would anyone go, oh, I want to? No. But sometimes that's how we live. Right. Lukewarm, apathetic, silent. World War II happened because with the rise of Nazi Germany, the church even said nothing. Someone say mercy. 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 Oh, only two of you took me for real. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Let's look at this. So there's a compromise in faith here. The articles of the house of God, capital G, which he carried into the land of Sinai to the house of his God, small g, he brought, into the, he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Listen, the first sign of, of decay is religious compromise. Spiritual compromise. A decrease in faith. That's the first sign that we're not thriving. When we ourselves, even as believers, start to compromise on our faith. Hear me in this church. When we compromise the little things, those small things, the little foxes that spoil the vineyard, when we compromise and we go, ah, eh, nobody will know. The Father always knows. If you want to thrive spiritually, get compromise out of your life. Un Root it. Root it up. Get rid of it. We've got to lay the axe to the root. And some of the root causes begin in the compromise. But not only is it the compromise of faith, let's look at three through five. Then the king instructed uh, Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there were no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king of appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Everything about this sounds so noble, so good. Three years of training, serving before the king, getting equipped for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to be able to serve in the king's palace. And we all go, oh, Position, yeah. Compromise in your wisdom. Because wisdom comes from the Lord. If any of you ask, lacks wisdom, ask. And he will give liberally without reproach to those who ask him. Wisdom comes from God. But when we apply ourselves to worldly wisdom, and I'm tired of telling Christians, stop thinking like the world does, please. Don't tell me what Dr. So-and-so said or this and that. Make sure it aligns with the word. And if it doesn't align with the word, no matter what it is, will you throw it away? Amen. I don't care how many authorities and degrees and everything else that's behind that. Stop compromising. Just because it sounds good. If it doesn't align with the word of God, I can guarantee you it's a lie from the pit of hell meant to destroy your soul. Period. You can't argue with me because your argument is no longer with me. It's with the word of God. When I was a Methodist, started to answer my call to ministry, I had to go back to school because that's what Methodists do. You've got to have a degree of higher education. It didn't matter if I took basket weaving my first year, you know, my undergrad. As long as I got an undergrad so that I could get a graduate degree. They didn't care what the undergrad was. But I hated school. My life and school did not get along. My junior high, the high school experience, 40 to 60 days a year, every year I skipped school. And many classes during session when I was in school, because I hated school. I loved learning, but I hated school. To go back to school, I went, oh God, yes, I'm willing to answer this, but do I have to do this? God took me to Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So where does knowledge come from? The fear of the Lord. I don't care what degree you have. Listen, I tell my folks all the time, everything I know was not taught me in seminary because that was cemetery. Everything I know has been taught me by the Holy Ghost. You have the same teacher available that I have. The Holy Ghost will guide you, the scripture says, into all truth. Why do you need the truth of the world? That system's opposed to God, period. Yes, sir. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Knowledge comes from God understanding. Paul writes, you remember the Apostle Paul? Everyone say Paul. Paul. 
Paul, who cared about the churches that he planted, he prayed this for them. He prayed that the spiritual eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Not their mind's understanding, the spiritual eyes of their understanding. So we can look and discern spiritually with understanding what's the truth in the situation. Because I'm going to tell you what, CNN's not going to tell you truth. They're going to tell you a perspective that they have that's, that's literally ungodly. When we were in Israel, my wife and I, last uh, February, with a, a, a great group of folks, we had a, a guy, a Jewish guy, that had come to Messiah. And he said, Israel hates CNN because they stand at the airport and they tell lies. That's Israel's perspective of CNN, just so we know in America. Because in America, so much of us, we revere these news figureheads. Well, they have an agenda. They're no longer telling you the truth. They're trying to give you, give you information that informs you to shape your worldview to align with an agenda that's meant to destroy America in your life. Understanding comes from God. So listen, those of you that might be inclined to be takers, we need to beware because immersion in culture and tradition, because this is what's happening. The king here, Nebi, my good buddy, Nebi's taking some of the children of Israel and he's mingling it with some of his leaders. So these are the more elite people and he's trying to inundate them so that they'll adopt their worldview, their practices, their culture, so that the leaders of Israel will go back to their tribes and influence them. And that's what happens when we let the world invade our wisdom, our, our understanding, and our knowledge, is we come back into the church and we say, but what about and this and that? And we alter the word of God. And I'm pretty sure that my Bible, you need to look it up for yourself, but my word says, do not take from or add to the word. Period. End of report. Stop doing it. This is what drives me crazy. Pastor, I don't know if you're this way. I cannot stand when Christians say this, and I've had this happen 31 years senior ministry. Pastor, I know that's what the Word of God says, but... And literally right after that, literally right after that, because I want to say, listen, I can say this because you're all in my house. I get to leave. Pastor Jim can't tell you this. What I want to say is shut up. As soon as I hear the word but, shut up. That's what I want to say. Now, I don't say it, but I'm probably more crass than your pastor is. No, I am. Ask my people. You guys, you guys can compare notes after. Listen, because I tell my people, even on the bus ride over here, somebody was saying, I was asking about, hey, listen, what is it that you need God to do in this journey? And someone was saying something, and I went, listen, if that's really how you feel, get over yourself. Like, I didn't temper it. I didn't filter it. Nothing. Because that ain't how it's going to happen. I'm not gentle. I'm not kind. I'm loving and I'm true. But I'm not gentle and I'm not kind. Pray for me that the fruit of the Holy Spirit would be in me. Because I do read gentleness and kindness in there. So just pray for me for that. But when I need to be, when someone's hurting, I'll be gentle. And I'll be kind. But when it comes to truth, there's no compromise in me. None. We've got to stand. So if we're inclined to try to mingle, because literally as soon as they say but, everything after that invalidates. It's like, I don't even listen. It's like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. I don't even hear it. Because they're trying to argue with me the word of God, and they're trying to invalidate the word with justification. I'm like, just, just stop. Just absolutely. Now listen, maybe you haven't been so bold as to say, I know what the word says, but, but you've probably lived this way. Like when the conviction of the Holy Ghost comes in, I know I shouldn't say this thing, gossip, but, or, or we justify, well, I'm only telling you so that you'll pray. No, you're passing on gossip. Because <laughs> we'll spiritualize our sin to justify our behavior, which is in argument with the Word of God. Everything after the but needs to be gone. We call it excrement, right? Everything from the butt on is excrement. Follow me on that. That's two T's, not one, for those of you that are slow on the uptake. <laughs> but that's what I consider it when that's what we do. Like we're arguing with the Word of God as if somehow, listen, this is true. I'm going back to my first church, so this is a long ago story. I haven't heard it much lately because people are more sophisticated in how they try to approach me because they're trying to, so I've heard two things I'll share with you about this. Back in the 90s, 
I was pastoring a church that we were blowing up in this small town, and there were some people that were kind of taken aback by, by my preaching and everything that was going on. And they, and they said to me, they said, Pastor, this is the 90s. You've got to get with it. And, and I'm like, what does the 90s have to do with truth? Like somehow truth has evolved to match their worldview and their sin. No, nope, that wasn't it. But then I had somebody else literally in the 2000s sitting together with them in a, in a very vulnerable point and broken point of their life, coming to my wife and I for counsel, and she would sit with me across from me, coffee table in between us, and she'd explain some things, and I'd give her biblical truth. And this is what she said. She said, Pastor, can you just take your pastor hat off and be a real person? Yeah. Been there, brother. <laughs> exactly. Like, what are they... Because this is my answer. Let me give you my answer. I don't know what your pastor would say, but I know what I did say because, again, I'm not kind and I'm not gentle. I said, listen, A, I can't take off the pastor hat, but even if I could, my answer is not change it. This is who God's made me to be. I'm informed by his word. His word doesn't fit just because I'm a pastor. It's truth. It defines my life. And I'm a pastor because of a call, not because I'm not speaking this because I'm a pastor. This is true, Period. Like, we, we are just so crazy. Stop thinking that we can compromise in our culture and our tradition and get forward with God. It says, the king appointed for them a daily provision. This is U.S. government 101 from 2020 forward. The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank in three years of training. We've been giving away the farm. And our culture has been eating it up. That's not going to cause you to thrive. That's going to kill us. Because that can't go on forever, first of all. And the king also knows he's only going to do it for a certain time, and then they're going to be lopped off too. So there are people that are behind these promises, acting as if this thing is going to go on forever, but sooner or later they're going to lop off our heads. So we've got to discern now so we can take a stand. And we should have discerned a year and a half ago. Yeah. But I'm here to give you a warning because that's what we're doing. We're sounding the alarm as we travel across the country. Is that all right? Okay. So let's go on. Chapter 1, verse 6. Now among those, were the sons of Judah, the, uh, among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah. Hear their names. They're Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah. The problem is what the world wants to do to your identity. That's who they are. Please hear me in this. So if you don't know who you are, listen to what's going to happen as the world invades your life. To the chief of the eunuchs, he gave them names. Daniel, he named Balthazar. To Hananiah, he called them Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Ezariah, Abednego. The world wants to change your identity. The devil is a liar. He wants to destroy your understanding of who you are. Take away your heritage, your inheritance. Their inheritance wasn't in Nebi's world. Their inheritance was in the destiny of Israel. Yes. So what happens when we take on the identity of the world is that we lose our inheritance. And we've become compromised by stepping into. So the thing that you have to do to be able to thrive spiritually is not to allow the world to label you, to identify you, to call you other than you are. You're no good. You'll never amount to anything. You're a loser. You'll always be that way. You can't possibly. All of these things. So nobody may have taken your name, Robin, and said, we're going to call you uh, Roberta. I mean, whatever. But the world wants to change Robin's identity. Yours too. And they're doing it, please notice, with what appears to be, I'm just going to use the word bribery, is that all right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to, I hate flattery. Don't come up to me after and go, oh, Pastor, that was so good. When you're inside, you're thinking, I can't wait till he leaves. <laughs> they're flattering them. Flattering is not godly. Did you know that? Right. Read the scriptures carefully. Some of the original language actually says that flattery is the language of the snake. 
Flattery is how they're trying to do this. But some of it's not just limited to a flattery. Some of us have come from abused backgrounds, myself included. And the abuse visited on by those in power or authority over us. So I'm a child of God, or I'm a pawn in the hand of my abuser. Come on. I'm a victim, or I'm a victor in Christ. Right. I'm a mess, or God can use me as a message. Right? Our identity is not tied to our place in society. Our identity is tied to him. Amen. And to him alone. Yes, sir. And so if you want to thrive spiritually, learn your identity in Christ. Jesse, I wish I could just recall a lot of what you were saying. Because he, he wrapped up so much of this just in his exhortation from, from the platform here. And we just, we just kind of Pastor, am I at liberty still? <laughs> you still love me, right, Jim? Brother, they, nothing they ain't heard by my mouth. <laughs> I, I literally cannot tell you from a pastor's perspective and as a spiritual person how appalling it is that somebody can be pouring out and we just sit there apathetically. I don't care whether we're preaching or whether we're leading worship. And, and listen, neither of these guys, five bucks after, right, Jim? That was the agreement? Neither of these guys paid me to say this. Stuff. This is just my heart for you this morning, what I observed. I literally went back to my prayer team and said, pray for me. Because I could feel the stagnation in the room. And I couldn't believe it because what I'm hearing from here wasn't stagnation, but I'm feeling it in the room. Where did we miss today? This should have been like, this should have been an altar call. This should have been people not even waiting for a call. They should have been running. Because like, I want to get right with God. I, I, gotta, I gotta get this. I gotta know who I am. So don't let the world change your identity. And don't give up your identity so freely. But Daniel, listen, this is it, right? How to thrive spiritually. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Everyone say purposed in your heart. Purposed in your heart. No, let's go this way. Purpose in my heart. Purpose in my heart. Because you gotta make a decision. Doesn't matter whether I decide. Doesn't matter whether the pastor decides. Doesn't matter whether Jesse decides. Doesn't matter if your spouse decides. Doesn't matter if your parents or your children decide. You gotta decide. Daniel purposed in his heart. Everyone say it one more time. Purposed in my heart. That he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's delicacies, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. We've got to stand. There has to be an absolute no compromise mindset. No room. The scripture says to make no uh, I'm trying to remember the, the word that's there. I can capture the... No accommodation for the flesh. No accommodation for the flesh. Listen, and this doesn't happen by accident. This is by intention. Daniel purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. So listen, let me tell you a funny way of doing this. That I'm just trying to keep it as light as I can, as heavy as the word is. So if your issue is that that whole box of Susie Q's is one setting that you're going to eat them in. Would you put them in a cabinet and put a lock on the cabinet? You will not defile yourself and you've got to take some action to make sure that you don't. You might not like Susie Q's. I don't even know if they still make Susie Q's. I used to stuff my face with Susie Q's. <laughs> Cake and creamy frosting. Mmm, yes. Mixed with chocolate too. It wasn't vanilla cake. Chocolate cake. But we've got to take some serious stance because there's some serious weight coming at us. They want to take away the privilege of being a church to pastors that don't allow for gay marriages in their church. And you might be okay if Jim takes a stand, but what happens if it comes to you? Sorry, pastor comes. To, I don't know what they call you here, sir. He's my friend. Is that okay? He's my friend. Some of you are going, I don't know, is that all right? Yeah, it's all right. Robin, is that okay? He's my friend. Robin's my friend too. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure, right? Got to include her. Yeah. Praying over Pastor last night on the comment. Went, oh, Robin, get over here. She's like standing in the background, like squeezing his hand, like, I don't know. No. 
man, we've got to take some serious stands and we've got to discern the time that we're living in and we've got to decide in our mind, we've got a purpose in our heart, I will not defile myself. No compromise and I've got to be intentional so that when we're confronted with whatever the temptation is to defile ourselves, we've already made up our mind. Because what happens is if we don't purpose in our heart ahead of time, when the temptation comes, we're going to fall right into it. Because if you don't know what you stand for, you'll fall for anything, as the old expression goes. So you've got to purpose it in your heart. If you're going to thrive spiritually, because Daniel's now living in the land of a foreign king in a country he no longer recognizes that's trying to take away his identity but as we know if you know the story of Daniel Daniel doesn't suffer defeat just because the country's living under this Daniel actually excels because of his place how many of you want to excel in the things of God in spite of what's going on around you right so we got to learn how to thrive, what it takes to thrive spiritually. Because while God's already given all of this, unless we take possession of it, listen, how many of you know when Israel entered the land, God still had to tell them, would you possess it? <laughs> like, don't just live there. Like, do something. I've given it to you. Act like you own it. That's why the, the, the torch is still out there. Like, do something with the inheritance that I've given to you. I always used to tell this. Oh, I don't want to pick up his PV speaker. All right. If this were a, a box... And I put a million dollars in the box, and I put it right there, and I said to you, it's yours. Come and get it. I wish I had it to give. I don't. But if I did, most of you wouldn't come and get it because you wouldn't believe it's really yours. You wouldn't possess what's been given to you, even though I would have done it in sincerity, because you wouldn't believe that it's yours. And that's how we live in, in relation to the promises of God. Amen. We act like they're not ours. Like maybe for someone like Pastor, because he's got the hat on. But for me, can you just take your hat off for a minute and act like a real person? No, this is who I am. Because this is who God is. This isn't about me. This is about him. And he's given us the inheritance. I'm just going to put the million dollars back on the altar, sir. In faith, believing God's going to prosper the church. Yes. All right. All right. So he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. So how do we stand against the world system? We've already had team. We've already had an illustration of this, and I pointed it out to you yesterday. So we're walking from the state house up in Augusta, Maine, back to the van that we had prayer walked from a couple of blocks where we parked it at the church that's an IPHC church made our way over to the state house then we're walking back and as we walked back there were a couple of guys little raggedy looking on their porch and stuff and you know spiritual the priests and the Levites were going to pass on by got about three steps past us and went wait a minute and I went back and I just talked to the brothers and I said to them men my name's Jeff Tibbetts. I'm the regional director in New England for the IPHC. We're just here on a prayer journey. Is there anything that we can pray for you? And they said, well, what do you mean? Like, what are the needs of Augusta or that you have? What, how can we pray for you? These guys didn't go, get out of here. But they thought about it for a minute. And they said, oh, well, well, I don't see this a lot, but maybe homelessness. And, and I'm really worried that when the government releases some of the regulations on like landlords and they can jack the rates or kick people out, that the, that the homelessness is going to increase. Could you pray for our community for homelessness? I said, sir, it would be an honor to do so. Thank you for sharing. And then we walked away. These guys were like willing to engage. Then we were at our next stop and we were outside the church doing like we did here. And there's a man on a porch diagonal from us. We're all Caucasian. 30 of us or so, I don't know how many were there. And there's a black man on the porch, and I gotta tell you, this is inner city, and when we got off of the van, the first thing that Kara found was a hypodermic needle on the ground. This is a place that people shoot up fairly regularly, right outside the church. There's a black man up there, and most of us would go, well, I wonder if he's part of the drugs. I don't know if I wanna, so I'm being me. Hey! Guy waves back, right? He's out listening to us. Like, what did these people do? Listen, they live in the building next to the church. There, there, and there. Hey! So we do the ceremony with the 
prophetic action, I said to him, I'll be right back. Sir, can you tell me your name? Oh, wait, let me introduce myself. My name's Jeff Tibbetts. Can you tell me your first name? I just wanted his first name. He said, my name is Javon. Javon, this is who I am, and this is what we're doing. Is there anything we could pray for you for? He says, man, be, I, I have COPD. I have a hard time breathing. I said, Javon, can I pray for you, like, right now? He said, that would be so good. So I prayed for him, God, four winds blow, come and breathe upon him. That as you did with the, the, the valley of dry bones, God, that as they walked and there was no breath in them, God, that you would breathe into Javon, that he might become a living being. You know, and then I finished up prayer, I thanked him, I went back over, and because of the act that I took, there was another brother in the team that we were ministering with that went on over and actually went up the steps of the porch. Javon received him. He got to minister to Javon. And I'm here to tell you something. You want to thrive spiritually? Stop being afraid of the world. Amen. Start to engage yeah. with them. Amen. Daniel enjoyed the favor. There was something in his conduct because he wasn't putting on something that was unnatural. This was just like breathing to him. It is to me. Hey! <laughs> and then let me go over and talk to you. The world isn't afraid of Jesus. The world's afraid of people that are judging them and hating on them right. who call themselves by Jesus' name. Wow. But they need to know Jesus. I was in the world. Were you in the world once? Did somebody bring Jesus to you? Yes, they did. Can we bring Jesus to others? Amen. If you're not thriving, this goes all the way back again to my Methodist days. 26 years ago is when I left. I know you guys have a pastor that never gets like this. So I'm going to tell you secrets of other pastors. Is that all right? Sometimes other pastors get moody and depressed. Shh, I'm telling on me, not yours. All right. Pastor, I love you anyway. And what God taught me is I can sit in my office. I won't say it. No, it's, even though it's biblical, I'm trying, can I use that language? No, God sanctify my mind. It's biblical what I was going to say, but I won't. And I can moan and groan and complain about my circumstances and the people being non-responsive and all of that. Or, I love God's oars. Or, I could get up and do something to serve people. And so I'd go out to nursing homes and hospitals and I would do visits and I would go, because I, Robin, you know, pastors, we're going to bring the blessing, right? Isn't that how this is supposed to work? And I'm telling you that every time I went out, when I chose that, I got more blessed than the people I went to minister to. If you're not thriving, would you learn to serve others? Amen. Daniel enjoyed favor because he was a servant leader. And that attracts people. We've got to learn to be like this. And it says, the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord my king, Nebi. Remember Nebi? Yeah. We're back to him for a moment. I fear him. He has appointed for you food and drink. Why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Everybody is self-interested. I don't care who you're running into. They're self-interested. But if we'll bear witness, hear me, if we'll bear witness to Christ, if we'll honestly live for God, I'm telling you that even their concerns will be taken away. But we've got to decide ahead of time because others are self-interested. So Javon had a need. And my high did nothing for him. But I'm believing that my prayer and the prayer of the brother who went over to him, yeah. that released Amen. some things. Amen. Amen. I'm believing that. We've got to start to live not only for ourselves, because people are self-interested. I ripped my Bible page, Jim. That was so bad when I'm emphasizing. My sweaty finger just ripped the page. All right. So this is what Daniel said. Because everyone's self-interested. So how do we respond to self-interested people? Don't you hate selfish people? How do we respond to them? Well, you can't hate them. You've got to love them. There's one. Then he said this. 
He said to the steward to whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please notice that the biblical writer is using the biblical names. They're not using Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when we see them in the when we see them later, the, 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 the world has called them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Daniel, these are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your servant for 10 days. Listen, what this is called is I'm going to show you a testimony. I'm going to show you a testimony. I'm going to be an example of Jesus to you. You want to thrive? Start to be an example. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you. Look at my life. See if it isn't true. Is there integrity in who I am and what I say or isn't there? Most of us live really closed off. We don't want to let people in. I have three scary words I'm going to share for you that I challenge my church with, even people that are hurting. Transparency, authenticity, and vulnerability. If you're not living that way, you're not living biblically. Period. End of report. Take up your argument with God. Jesus became so vulnerable that even as they spat upon him and rejected him and were crushing a crown of thorns upon him and beaten his back and nailed him to a cross, here he is living vulnerably saying, Father, forgive him. He emptied himself of the glory of heaven, risking the rejection of humankind, saying, Father, I love them enough to die for them. And we go, yeah, but they hurt my feelings. And unless you've been crucified, you have no excuse. And even when you're crucified, you better learn to forgive. And it's scary. I just live in deep places. People don't like me much. I have people leaving church all the time because I'm really serious about challenging people for this. You cannot live closed and be authentic. You cannot be mistrusting and represent Jesus. You can't think the worst and have the mind of Christ. Test us. Let our appearance be examined before you in the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy. Listen, there should be a noticeable difference. I tell the stories. There are people that I've never preached the gospel to. Uh, I can't do it anywhere here. Is this a solid table? No, I won't do it. All right. I wish this was a good wooden pulpit. I worked at the YMCA in Keene for five years. No, for four years. As, as I was planting a church, I had to have a tent making job. And I'm working at the Y, and I'm there in the morning, and I'm opening up the building, and people are coming and going. My job is to greet them, sign them up for membership, buzz them in the door, all of that kind of fun stuff. There's a man that I had a good relationship with. I heard about a lot of his life story. He knew I was a pastor, but he didn't know much more than that. I didn't get to, like, literally share Christ as people come in and out. But one day, he walks in, and he hits the counter. First thing in the morning, five in the morning, he goes, bam. He goes, it's real to you, isn't it? I said, David, what's real? He goes, this faith thing. This is a man who left church. And it was a liberal church, and he said, they're too hypocritical. I'm thinking if the liberal church was conceived to be hypocritical, you know, what's he going to think of me, right? But here's the scoop. He hit the, ta- the, hit the counter. He goes, it's real to you. I said, David, what's real? He said, this faith thing. See, he saw Jesus in relation to how others treated him. And he said, it's real. Now I'm working many, many years earlier as a church planter back in Massachusetts. Now I'm a shift supervisor at Burger King. You know the jobs that most of us don't want to take anymore because they're beneath us and now they can't even find employees, kids even, to fill a counter? Well, I'm a shift supervisor. And I'm working at a register one day because someone on my shift didn't show up. And guess what the shift supervisor does? Fills a void. That's what we do. And there's a man that comes up, and he's in there all the time, and he gets coffee. He comes up, and he orders, I'd like my, you know, medium black coffee. He says, what is it with you? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're not the typical Burger King employee. What is it with you? And I said, what does that mean? (laughs) Well, you're different. I said, sir, do you have a moment to chat? And he said, I do, because he always gets his coffee, and he goes, and he sits in the dining room. So I told my crew. I'm going to be a few minutes. And I went and I sat down and I told him about Jesus. Because he examined what he saw behind a counter wearing a stupid orange, brown, and yellow hat with a brown shirt with a little name tag on it with the brown slacks. Slacks. (laughs) Guys don't wear slacks. Ladies wear slacks. And slacks went out in the 70s. But anyway... 
and I got to share Jesus with him because he examined like what he saw mm -hmm. and it made him wonder what's different about you are people inquiring of you like what's different are we living different enough than the world that should they examine us, they might find us worthy of consideration for the cause of Christ? Yeah. Might they look at us and go, man, I need what you have. I don't even know what it is and I don't understand it. But what you have, I just, I need this. So my friend Dave from the Y, Deb and I got married after this. And my friend Dave got an invitation, and he and his wife Judy, a sweet, sweet woman. Dave was a retired educator. He was such a good guy. But if you would have talked to him and you didn't build a relationship with him, you would have thought he was ungodly. He's so far from God, and he was hungry. In the meantime, the Y and Keen built a new YMCA. So our old ratty building that I was at when he smacked the counter was no longer. We were in this new facility. Deb and I got married, and our, our marriage ceremony was a worship service with a ceremony in the midst of it. And in the middle of it, at one point, Deb and I are at the altar when couples are usually, you know, ah, looking at each other, holding hands, sappy little drooly on the mouth, you know, all that stuff. And we're just worshiping, hands uplifted. My, Dave, my friend Dave comes in the following Monday, comes up to the counter again, smacks the counter, and goes, I got a different picture of you. I said, Dave, what's that? He goes like this. Now listen to me. This is a man who left the church because he thought the church was too hypocritical, and now he sees worship. I'm getting chills right now thinking about it. That's his image now of a man, of a man surrendered in worship. Could we give a better picture than that? I heard Jesse screaming, if you will, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm, I'm hearing his heart cry yell, screaming. Earnestness rising up from within him, surrender, surrender, surrender. All you've got to do is surrender. I wish I had his deep baritone voice. Resonated off the walls. And we just sat here. Like, why weren't we on our faces? Because we got to surrender every day. Every day. So I surrendered in salvation, but am I surrendering my life today or am I trying to live for me still? Am I surrendered? Let me finish up the chapter. Is that all right? At the end of the 10 days... Oh, no, so he, the, the, the servant of the eunuch, consented in, in this matter, and he tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better. I've got pictures that I can tell you. Like, you've all maybe seen them if you're on social media at all. Maybe if you have Christian organizations you're a part of. You see this woman who is a heroin addict with, like, no teeth and stringy hair and just a gaunt face and everything. And then she found Jesus, and this picture after salvation is she's got a beautiful smile, and she's got a way radiance about her. God literally will change our countenance when we come to know who he is. We can't stay miserable looking creatures and be in love with Jesus. Can't do it. Amen. Let the, the joy of the Lord invade your space and, and, and flow out of you. Out of us will flow rivers of living waters. Amen. Their countenance was better. Everyone say better. better. Fatter in flesh, richer, fuller, more filled than all the young men who ate the portion of the king. Why? Because the things of the world, all they do is they make us fat. Susie Q's are not going to help me. My girlish figure goes to pot so quick. They taste so good. You know the problem with sin? It always starts so good. But the end of it is ruin. But we've been told that from the beginning. Don't take of the tree, for it will end in death. From the beginning, we do it anyway. Thank you, sister. And we've got the whole Bible now. We've got thousands of years of testimony. And still we're doing stupid stuff. Thus the steward took away their portions of delicacies in the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. You know what that says to me? They were still holding those things there, trying to tempt them with it. For those 10 days. The world won't easily relinquish its hold on you. 
But if we stay consistent, it gets removed. Submit to God, draw near unto him, the devil must flee. Submit comes before draw near. We as believers, we just say, well, I'm drawing near to God, but are you submitted? Submit to God, James says. Draw near unto him. The devil will flee. All right, finish up. As for the four young men, God gave them knowledge. Oh, God gave them. Wow, imagine that. God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. If you know the story of Daniel, that's going to play huge later on. I just don't have time today. Y'all want to be here till tonight? I'm good. I'll keep going. He gave them all underst- I mean, understanding in all visions and dreams. It plays a huge part later. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, now the king's calling for them. The chief eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, these men who disobeyed him, stood against the world, put a torch on the capital lawn, poured out some wine, put some salt in it, and put some oil. They had told these guys, be outside the fence. I'm like, I'm not standing outside the fence. It's just who I am. Because I'm emboldened by the Holy Spirit to take a stand. And if they come and arrest me, let them do it. They're brought before Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, tested them. And listen, among them all, meaning who? All the nobles and all the wives that the king had. He said, among them all, there was none, none, everyone say none. None. Found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. Oh, listen, God will lift you up. Stop trying to compromise and, 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 and find a, a place, a position for yourself. We need to see God's glory being revealed. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians, the astrologers, all who were in his realm. All of those in the world, we're supposed to exceed. We're supposed to excel beyond. We're supposed to have an answer for that is greater than the world. Yes, sir. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. God's serious about his people. We're either foolish or serious to be taking a van ride across the country in the middle of summer, going into the heat of the middle of America, (laughs) to stand in a sun-baked field for six hours, believing that God's going to pour out revival. But I'm convinced it'll be ten times better than anything the world has to offer. I'm convinced. And if you're going to be praying in agreement with us, I'm not asking you to come with us. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm not asking you to give anything more. If you're willing to pray in agreement, that's all I'm asking for, would you just come and fill the altar? Let's pray together. If you're willing to pray in agreement that God is going to be glorified in our travel, 